piecewise linear interpolants have discontinuous derivatives and second order pointwise accuracy. Depending on the context, this may be fine, but we can improve the accuracy if we use smoother interpolants, meaning an interpolant that has more continuous derivatives. A very common choice is the cubic spline interpolant. This has a cubic polynomial on each subinterval from tk to tk plus 1, and the cubic spline has two continuous derivatives everywhere. Let me draw out the complete interval here. Here's our spline interpolant. On subinterval number k, we let sk be the cubic polynomial on that subinterval. Each sk has to interpolate the given data at both ends of its subinterval. So in each subinterval, we can write out two conditions. At each node, where we change over from one sk to the next definition, this transition has to have continuous first and second derivatives, and we can write those out too. These points where the third derivative can change are usually called knots in spline interpolation terminology. Thus, each subinterval gives us two conditions, which altogether become two n equations. Each not gives us two more conditions for 2n minus two more equations. The grand total is 4n minus two equations on the unknown coefficients of the cubics. Now each of these sks is a cubic polynomial that's defined by four coefficients for a grand total of 4n coefficients that we have to determine. Hence, we are two equations shy of a complete set and a unique solution for the interpolant. In fact, there are many different ways that these additional conditions can be supplied. One very well-known way is called the natural spline. That involves the second derivatives at the endpoints. For pointwise accuracy, a better choice is called the not a not spline, which gives us an extra degree of continuity at two of these knots. In fact, it says that these two points aren't knots at all because two cubics that match up to the third derivative are really the same function. That's the choice that we'll use in our implementation. So to recap, we now have 4n equations. They are linear in the 4n unknown coefficients. So we have a linear system that has to be solved for the coefficients at a cost of order n cubed flops. This is unlike piecewise linear interpolation where there is no system to solve at all. But the benefits are smoothness, which looks better for plots at least, and fourth order accuracy. So here, C is a constant. The nodes have a uniform spacing H, like we said in piecewise linear theory. And Sn here means the entire cubic spline on n nodes, uh, not the nth piece like I used in the notation above. Sorry for that clash. The approximated function f has to have four derivatives in order for this bound to be true. 
by going from piecewise linear to the cubic spline, we go from second order convergence to fourth order convergence. MATLAB does have a built in routine for spline interpolation, but here's one built from the ground up. I'm not going to go through it in detail because a lot of it is based on algebra that I didn't go through in detail. It's all in the book. But just so you can see kind of the structure of how this works, you're given the um, nodes and the data at those nodes. n is one less than the number of nodes. So from there, we're going to build a linear system of size 4n by 4n for the cubic coefficients in each interval. You end up having four kinds of conditions. One's for all the left point endpoints. One is for all the right endpoints. The third type of condition is the continuity of the first derivative. And the fourth type is the continuity of the second derivative. And finally, to make the whole system square, you need two more conditions. And those are based on what we call the not a not conditions, continuity of the third derivative at the second and next to last node. So you put all those together into a big matrix A. Then you solve for the conditions and you, you get Z. Z is a bunch of coefficients for all the different intervals. So you end up having to break those up into uh, four groups, A, B, C, and D, representing the different powers of T or the different powers of X in the interpolants. And then what the function is going to return is S. S is something that you can call as a function of S, as a function of X. And so here you're seeing how the thing is evaluated. Find which interval x is in and evaluate the polynomial for that interval. Let's take a look at the spline interpolation in action. Uh, first we'll look at the case of some cardinal data, so uh, the data is 1 at one of the nodes and 0 at the others. So the interpolant of that will be a cardinal function. Now, Unlike the piecewise linear case, it's not easy to write a formula for the cardinal functions in spline interpolation. And in fact, the behavior is a lot different too. As you can see, here we actually overshoot 1 a bit. And the thing is not just non-zero in one or two intervals, it's non-zero over the whole interval of nodes and you see this oscillating behavior. So that's the price you pay for making something which is smoother. It has two continuous derivatives, but it also doesn't have that nice simple structure that the cardinal functions did in piecewise linear interpolation. For the same set of nodes, here's a function to interpolate. All right, so a nice smooth function, and the points show the data values. And then based on that, we can compute the spline interpolant and plot that. So of course it has to interpolate at the nodes. It's not terribly great in between, but this is a small number of nodes. Finally, let's do a convergence experiment. So we're just going to evaluate the error at 10,001 points in the interval. And I'll choose n values of n that grow exponentially. For each value of n, you will use linearly spaced, equally spaced nodes, compute the interpolant, and find the infinity norm of that interpolant over the interval. So as you can see, the errors do decrease, and they decrease faster than piecewise linear interpolation. Piecewise linear is second order. This is fourth order. So for example, as we go from 16 to 32, if we doubled n, the error should go down by 2 to the fourth power. That's 16. So this should be a factor of 16. Well, that's not so easy to do in your head. Um, it's easy to check with a graph. So on a log log scale, fourth order errors should have a slope of negative 4, which is what this dashed line is. And yes, after some initial things for the small values of n, asymptotically the convergence definitely looks to be fourth order.